Hello, everybody. We are starting uh, this session of the 19 uh, European Conference of, of Computational Biology. Uh, this session is uh, inside a, a new uh, group of sessions that have been uh, uh, named uh, a glimpse of into global uh, bioinformatics communities. And uh, the idea in these kind of sessions uh, for uh, from now and uh, probably in future ESCB, ESCB uh, meetings is to have different communities participating uh, uh, in, in this uh, session. Uh, the, the first one is for us today uh, is the Latin America uh, bioinformatics uh, community uh, represented by people well, that are associated or, or related to uh, soy, soy bio. Soy bio is the uh, Ibero-American Society of uh, Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. And here we have today with us uh, four speakers um, from four different countries, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and Mexico, from Latin America. Um, and uh, uh, we, the first one is uh, Benito Carvalho, uh, then uh, Gregorio Iraola, then uh, Wendy Gonzalez, and then Alejandra Medina. We are starting with uh, uh, Benit, uh, Benilton. Benilton, I'm not, I'm not going to do an introduction to each one of them because uh, we, are, uh, we have to be uh, very strict with the time. Uh, each one of you, you have uh, around uh, 15 minutes to uh, speak and five minutes for questions. In total, 20 minutes. I will be uh, just looking at the time. And Benilton, he is a, a statistician and a person very much involved in the uh, development of, of bioconductor and working in the job Hawkins and uh, Benito, please you can start your, your your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Uh, thank you everyone for being here to this, uh, today for our talk. We are going to talk today about uh, the BIPMED. BIPMED is the Brazilian Initiative on Precision Medicine. This is an initiative based in Campinas, Sao Paulo in Brazil, and hosted by the University of Campinas. Um, hold on, let me try to go to the next slide. There. I want to start by thanking the team that actually made this possible. Uh, this is Dr. Isia Lopes Sandes, then Dr. Cristiani Rocha, uh, Wellington Souza and Dr. Rodrigo Secolin. Uh, they, they are the people who actually made all this work possible on different fronts. And the idea that we have with BIPMED is that it is uh, uh, the result of a coalition of five big centers in Sao Paulo State. These centers, they are funded by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation called FAPESP, and they are the Brazilian Research Institute on Neuroscience and Neurotechnology, the Center for Computational Science and Engineering, Center for Research in Cell Therapy, Center for Research on Inflammatory Disease, and the Obesity and Com Comorbidities uh, Center, uh, Research Center. These uh, centers got together to create uh, an infrastructure for precision medicine in Brazil. Uh, the first product that we had uh, here with BIPMED was a genomic database, first of its kind in Latin America, that gives us an insight to admix the populations and in particular to the admixed population of Brazilians. We got this data to be produced in two ways, actually. Uh, we have a database that is based on whole exome sequencing, and we also have a second database that is based on, on microarrays, on SNP microarrays. So far, we started this work back in 2015 we started working with the LoveD uh, database scheme. Later on, we added uh, what we call a beacon. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about a beacon later on. 
in 2016, we had different clients uh, from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. We had a client for Bioconductor. We had a web application. Uh, in 2018, we started moving all our software to a cloud environment. So everything is now uh, cloud ready. And we came up with something that we call Brave. It's the BIPMED Variant Explorer. Now in 2019, uh, we got added uh, multiple organizations to be supported by our, by, by our software. We got uh, multiple beacons and multiple data sets. And what happens now is that we can also do user authentication in order to do data management. Now, back to the databases. The LoveD database is a leading open variation database, version three. This is actually a great software that we have been using here. It's web-based and it's focused on sequence variation. It has an API that allows simple questions to be asked to the database and it gives us back listing of genes and varying variations and patients who have those type of variations. And it's freely available uh, for you guys to, to use. Now, the instances that we have are actually looking into five different databases. Uh, we've got the whole exome data, the microarray, then we have also a few phenotypes available for use, which is epilepsy, craniofacial abnormalities, and breast cancer. Uh, BitMed through this LoveD database is being accessed from people all around, all around the world. Uh, surprisingly, Brazilians are not the top one accessors of this database. It's actually uh, China followed, uh, United States followed by China. Uh, and then uh, what I have to show you guys next is actually the Brave. Brave is the BitMed Variant Explorer. This one is actually an alternative strategy for you guys to access uh, BitMed data. And soon it should be available for you to use on your own data sets. It's, uh, it gives us an improved user experience. It is possible for you to do programmatic access through the API. It allows different data sets, different genome versions. It requires authentication when needed. Uh, it does give you ways of doing importation and management and sharing and searching of data. It can be used on any VCF file and it's transparent for the cloud. Now, I'll just save you from this. And this is the, the basic interface for, for Brave. What happens is that you can actually uh, type search. These search can be based on gene symbols, can be on genomic ranges or position or DB SNP ID. And what you're gonna get is a list of the, the findings that the system gets. This is a, a, a simple web interface, but the power that we have on Brave is actually the fact that it can be accessed through API. API. What that means is that, for example, if you are running a software, let's say on Python, you can start asking questions. I want to see all the variants that were observed in less than 1% of, of the samples of this particular data set, and then you can get everything right on. So this is the, the actual uh, uh, force that Brave has. One other product that we uh, uh, delivered through BIPMED is something that we are calling Espresso Caller. And this is a, a piece of software that is based on GATK version four and uses all of its best practices. Uh, the reason that we are 
looking at this and, and doing something like this is because most of the time, what happens is that we get samples done by batches. So for example, when uh, uh, I start sequencing patients here in Campinas, I get a batch, let's say of 200, and then later on I get 300 more, et cetera. And what we want to make happen is to combine all these samples and do uh, a data set based on genotyping. And to do that, we are now able to, to achieve this objective by using one single command line using this Espresso caller. The other nice thing about it is that it can be, it works exactly the same regardless of the type of the system that you might be using. So let's say if you got a, a, a workstation, the command that you're gonna use for Espresso Caller is, is exactly the same command that you would use if you were on a HPC system or on the cloud on Amazon or Google, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, now, as I told you, we, uh, we work also on something that we call beacon. And the beacon is exactly what the word says in the sense that it, it gives you a search box and what you give there is the genomic uh, location of the mutation that you're looking at. When you hit search, what happens is that this beacon through the beacon network, it works like, let's say, a Google for genomic variation. It goes all around the world and it asks, uh, here I'm showing only uh, almost 60 servers, but today it's hitting more than 100 servers around the world looking for the particular variant that you pointed out. So in this particular case, for me, it's showing that it found this mutation here in BIPMED, but it also found it on UC Berkeley and, and at OpenSNP. Now, if this is a variant that I think that may be uh, associated, for example, with the, the closure of a given patient case, I could actually get in touch with these folks here and, and try to understand why they have the very same mutation. So this is being used a lot by our, by our geneticists because it allows us to see uh, particular mutations all over the world. We've got uh, also the side of the project that is now growing very fast. It is a disease specific set of projects so today we have on our data sets uh, cases of uh, uh, epilepsy, craniofacial anomalies, uh, breast cancer, uh, uh, HVP, hereditary loss, uh, hearing loss, neurofibromatosis, and tuberous sclerosis. We are getting uh, uh, contacted by all these researchers because they not only want to make use of the infrastructure that we are setting, but they also want to increase visibility of their data sets. Now, um, let's just pass on this. There. So uh, what we have uh, uh, in, in BIPMED, in addition, to these data sets that are disease specific is the set, it's actually two data sets of what we are calling reference individuals. I do not want to call them controls because we did not ascertain by, by, by phenotype, but these guys are people who are regularly met on the streets, for example. So what we started seeing here is that these subjects show a set of variants. So when we started comparing them to the 1000 genomes, 
we started seeing that a lot of, actually 1%, 7,000 mutations that were common on European subjects, they are rare in Brazilians. And then about 75,000 uh, variants that were called rare in Europeans, they are common in Brazilians, and so on and so forth. So what these start showing us is that uh, the, the, the genomic medicine decisions that we would start making should be aware of population structure. What I'm saying is that if we are ever here in Brazil going to use uh, genomics to make decisions through medicine, it's not 100% fine if we simply start using uh, genomic references that are from abroad. In this particular case, you guys can see why, because we have a bunch of variants that could be, for example, causal for particular diseases, but in, in our case, uh, are seen as common or rare in our populations. Now, the, the final thing that I'm gonna show you to you uh, is, is this. If we start looking at the, the particular PCA that you guys see on the 1000 Genome Project, what you see there in black dots are the Brazilian subjects. So it's actually making a gradient between the European and the African subjects. So in this particular case, my point is that if, is that if we are to treat a Brazilian subject for some of them, we have to behave as that person was coming from uh, Europe. And for other cases, we have to treat them as they were coming from Africa. And this is what we showed on the last slide. And it's going to be very soon on genomic medicine. And that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Benito. Uh, we don't have uh, any any written question. Um, let's uh, maybe if we have some time later, uh, let's go to uh, stick to the time. That's perfect. Um, uh, Benito, thank you very much. I think you show one one question I have, but it's very basic. You show it uh, well. Is that this database that you are creating is linked to many other databases of similar type, no? Uh, mm -hmm. from, from the States and also from Europe, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, let's, let's continue because uh, we have to stick to the time. And uh, next speaker is uh, Gregorio Iraola. Uh, he's an, an expert in metagenomics and phylogenomics uh, from the Institute Pasteur in Montevideo, Uruguay. So, uh, Gregorio, uh, please, if you can start uh, your talk. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, I will start here. Uh, let me um, put in full screen mode. Well, um, I'm, uh, I will be talking about uh, keep of, uh, of results uh, uh, that we are now obtaining in our lab, that is the Microbial Genomic Lab uh, at the Institute Pasteur in Montevideo. Um, and my talk is going to be focused on, on, on this we are doing now, that is uh, building city scale genomic maps uh, of microbes that are circulating in the urban environment for improved response to emerging infectious diseases. So in this context that uh, I am hearing like a bell ring. <laughs> uh, sorry. I cannot see your slide, your screen. Uh, you can see? We cannot. No? Uh, well, sorry. Let's, let's try again. Uh, No? Yes.
you can see now. When it goes to full less. Uh, sure, screen, I don't know. Let's see. Um, because it says it's sharing. Uh, oh, you can present it like that. I can, we can see it like that. Okay, 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 okay. I will move ahead with the with this uh, with this format. Well, um, so um, my presentation is going to be focused on on this topic, and uh, and I will share you with you a couple of examples on on, on this work we are developing. Uh, so, um, as you may know, uh, metagenomics uh, and genomics as well focused on, on the study of, of bacteria and other microbes can be today used to, to characterize how human derived microbes uh, are spread in the urban environment. A uh, couple of years ago, some work showed that indeed the, the bacteria that were present in the sewage systems of, of different cities uh, resembled the, the composition of the, of the human gut microbiome so this opens uh, different possibilities to study the different diseases or infections or, 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 uh, or other um, microbes which are uh, interesting from different point of view uh, directly from the sewage system of, of the cities as a way to, to screen uh, for these microbes in a non-invasive way. Uh, basically because uh, the, the feces of people that uh, that lives in cities is is uh, are being uh, delivered through the sewage system so this is something that that we are doing uh, since a couple of years ago here in montevideo um, and uh, i i will briefly uh, show you uh, some results about this it's a paper that we published the past year uh, in which we we sampled the the environmental waters from from different points of the coast of, of Montevideo. This was this first sampling was uh, was collected on April uh, 2016. It's uh, like uh, three four years ago, and um, we took waters from uh, beaches and also from uh, sewage pipes that are the red ones that you can see in the map. This map is the, the uh, urban area of Montevideo. And our intention was to study the, the microbes that can be important for human health here and, and focus on also the reservoirs for antimicrobial resistance. So first, uh, with this uh, static photograph of, of, uh, of the composition of, of uh, microbial communities in, in these environments, we, we observe a, a complete separation between uh, the composition of communities in the sewage and beach waters. This is expectable because uh, of uh, the, um, the contamination with, with fecal material that indeed we, we suspected uh, from, the sewage, uh, from the sewage waters. But then when we focused on, on on the composition of uh, of this uh, of these two environments um, related to to the antimicrobial resistant uh, genes repertories that that we can find uh, there, uh, we observe that uh, also the sewage uh, communities uh, were enriched in different uh, uh, antimicrobial resistant genes, and those genes were uh, belonging to the antimicrobial uh, or the antibiotic classes that uh, are most common, <coughs> commonly used for for human for human treatment in the in in medicine. And uh, as a conclusion of this, a uh, lot of AMR genes found in the sewage, uh, highlighting the presence of carbapenemases and extended spectrum beta lactamases. Uh, had been frequently uh, found in uh, bags that were isolated from uh, nosocomial infections in Montevideo during the last decade. And also uh, an important point to, to highlight is that uh, 
In Montevideo, like in many other cities, hospitals do not treat patients' fecal wastes before uh, evacuating them to the, to the municipal sewage system. So this, this, um, this bacteria that are probably being uh, delivered uh, from patients that are being treated with a lot of antibiotics are directly poured into the, the environment uh, and um, are in touch with, with other um, environmental bacteria. Also, we found that most of these genes that were present in, in the sewage, these AMR genes, uh, were mainly present in uh, plasmids and integrons, um, which is, uh, which is uh, more dangerous uh, from, from, from the pers perspective of horizontal gene transfers because these genes are easily uh, shared between different bacteria, opening the possibility to uh, or for the emergence of, of new genotypes that, that can lead to, to, the, to the extensive uh, antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we, we studied uh, which are the, the, the taxonomic uh, distribution of, of these uh, of this, um, AMR genes. And we found that most of these genes uh, and, and typically the, the genera of bacteria that are uh, present in the sewage uh, environment uh, are typical uh, those genera that enclose uh, human pathogens or, or, or very important bacteria from the clinical point of view, like Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, or um, Enterobacter. But uh, now, um, okay, uh, we, we had we, we had some, some clues about uh, how, how was the composition of, of this in the urban environment, uh, but uh, we had a still open question that if it's these AMR mechanisms are indeed coming from pathogens that are being delivered from the, hum from the hospital environment. So remember that, that uh, we had this, this sampling first in, in April, uh, 2016. Then we were also working together a hospital that is in Montevideo and in this hospital during uh, 2017 uh, this hospital had a very important KPC nosocomial outbreak uh, caused by Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, so we, we started to characterize this outbreak. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this, the bacteria that uh, were isolated in this outbreak were uh, almost pan-resistant. They were resistant to every, every antibiotic that is uh, relevant for clinical treatment. Um, so it was really complex to treat. Uh, and we used so, uh, a hybrid assembly approach based on Illumina and nanopore sequencing. To, to complete the whole genome sequences for, for strains isolated in the context of this, uh, of this outbreak. Um, and we, we determined that this uh, Klebsiella pneumonia that caused the outbreak was uh, a genotype that is called ST11 and uh, enclosed a new plasmid with the several antimicrobial resistant genes, including the KPC1 carbapenems, KPC2, sorry. Um, but what next? So we put this uh, in the phylogenetic context of, of, the, of the known uh, diversity of ST11 uh, clones uh, uh, around the world. And, and we discovered that this uh, ST11 from Uruguay was a novel sublineage characterized by uh, resistance to carbapenemases and cholestine as well. That was a novel or uh, extensive feature of this sublineage. But then when we started to study um, the intra, um, the, the, the intra outbreak diversity, we found that the outbreak was divided like in the two clusters that uh, correspond with the phylogenetic distinction of, 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 the, of the outbreak uh, strains. 
and this also was um, uh, was within the hospital, uh, and this correlated with the uh, lack of uh, physical contact of patients that were uh, in the early phase uh, of the outbreak and in the late phase. So we reveal a kind of intra-hospital evolution of this of this strain uh, that uh, was indeed uh, correlated with the geospatial uh, distribution of, of patients in different wards and different er areas within the hospital. And this is, will be important for what's coming next, that uh, um, just by chance, uh, we perform an additional uh, environmental sampling of the city in November uh, 2018 uh, that coincided with the end of the outbreak in the hospital. Um, so our question was, was, okay, can we try to, to look if, if the outbreak strain uh, that we recover from patients inside the hospital uh, is now present in the metagenomes that uh, we uh, sequenced from the, from the environment that uh, come from sewage waters? And the answer for that question indeed was yes, because we, um, using genome result metagenomics, uh, we recover a high quality metagenomic assembly genome that we achieved to classify as Klebsiella pneumoniae ST11 from two sewage samples. Uh, and this, uh, these genomes recover from the uh, environment were identical to those that were causing uh, the outbreak in uh, the hospital. Uh, and moreover, we were also able to find uh, the megaplasmid that was associated with the ST11 clone uh, that uh, was causing the, the multi-drug resistant phenotype in this, in this uh, outbreak associated clone. And also, finally, uh, in the sampling that uh, were performed on April 2016, like two years ago, this was absent. This was not present in the, in the metagenomes. So with this, we, we, we found the uh, first uh, evidence of, of uh, dissemination of a very important clone that caused uh, a, a terrible outbreak in a hospital being delivered or being disseminated into the urban environment. Um, this prompted us, oh, sorry, and the, but the, the end uh, of, of this story is that when we placed the, the, the metagenomic assembly genome that we recover from the environment in the uh, uh, outbreak phylogeny, it, uh, it was placed in the late cluster. So this indicated or suggested that indeed this bug was, uh, was eliminated from the hospital to the environment and no uh, in the opposite uh, side. Um, so I was telling that this prompted us to, to expand our, our, uh, our work uh, and, uh, and, and open new questions that uh, are focused on, on, on answering what are we spreading into the urban environment? The, the story I, I just told you is about uh, the interaction between the hospital setting and the urban environment. But now we expanded this with a project that is now ongoing. It's a, a Pfizer Global Medical Grant that is uh, focused on uh, building a city scale molecular map of antimicrobial resistance among, among hospital settings, the urban environment, and also the human population. So we will be producing uh, genomic and metagenomic data from hospital um, environment, uh, hospital uh, wastes, hospital surfaces, the urban environment, uh, uh, collecting sewage and, and, and other environmental waters, and also studying the human gut microbiomes of people that is living in Montevideo. This is also related to our Latin Biota uh, consortium that I am leading in partnership with the Sanger Institute uh, that is focused on uh, 
expanding the knowledge and the diversity we are, we know about uh, the um, the composition of the human uh, microbiota in Latin American populations. This map shows uh, the representation of, of uh, human gut metagenomes per country, and as you as you see, Latin America is still uh, a bit uh, a black hole, and we are now sampling and sequencing metagenomes from all these countries, uh, aiming to improve our representation and also to understand how uh, the composition of the microbiota of our populations can impact in uh, health and disease. And uh, this was very, this was uh, um, Pejoro, a very nice- We have to, yes. to, to finish. Okay, the, 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 I, I, I had a, uh, another, an, another story to tell, but I, I can finish here if you want, because the other was another topic that we were already, uh, we're already working in because of uh, the COVID pandemic, but uh, uh, it's how we apply all this uh, to, to uh, the Uruguayan response in order to uh, build these this, uh, maps also uh, uh, to, to fight against uh, the SARS-CoV-2. That is briefly, I can show you uh, what is more relevant, that is the development of, uh, um, of an application that can be used to, to, um, uh, to map in space and time different uh, characteristics in, in uh, this, is, uh, this is dynamic, but this is a screenshot. And, uh, and we can use this to, to monitor in the environment the presence of SARS-CoV-2 or any other uh, bacteria, like can be this Klebsiella that I show you uh, previously or any antimicrobial resistant gene or any other microbe of interest that one uh, can be uh, interested in tracking across time and space. And that's all. Uh, sorry for, for, for being out of the time. No, no, it's okay. Thank you, Gregorio. Uh, we have uh, just uh, one question from Christian Diaz Muñoz for you, Gregorio. It's written here saying, well, uh, of course, congratulations for the work. Uh, me as well, everybody's very nice metagenomic work. And Christian is asking how, uh, which was the strategy to, uh, to uh, uh, distinguish the sublimits of the ST11 from the other strains. Okay, uh, this this was a typical uh, phylogenomic approach in which we we collected all ST11 genomes that were available uh, from public databases, including ours, and we first uh, uh, built or genome uh, alignment from, from the whole data set. Uh, we filter out uh, recombination regions to, to keep just the clonal frame. Uh, this was using Gavins. And then we apply uh, uh, here BAPS, that is a, a population structure approach that uh, allows you to hierarchically identify population structure in, in any alignment or tree. And with this approach, we we evidenced that uh, that this clone from Uruguay was a distinct sublineage from from any other previously report uh, within the the ST11 clone. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a quick comment, uh, Gregorio, for you is that uh, well, you started to say, but I think in this metagenomic and studies of the microbioma we should start to look more for viruses, not only bacteria, you know, in our seaweeds or in our microbioma, because we have many, many different viruses, viruses and I think it's a little bit, uh, so far we know that with COVID is going to be a, a big issue. Yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. Uh, in just, I, I, I want to show you just uh, the, my last slide that is uh, my, <laughs> my contacts and, and also to, to highlight that uh, this is uh, a work with different institutions, but uh, uh, we are part of the MetaSav International Consortium 
that is uh, focused on on, uh, on studying the urban microbiomes from different parts <coughs> of the world, from different uh, cities, and um, we have a really nice collaboration with them. Uh, this is an international effort, and indeed uh, a very a very open question. Uh, uh, but uh, by now is to 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 improve the the approaches that uh, allows us to recover uh, viruses from from these metagenomic collections and we are working on that uh, very very strongly in in this uh, in this uh, efforts that we are leading from from here uh, okay. but yes are, are very it's a very very important question uh, particularly in the context of uh, the covid pandemic Yes, thank you, Gregorio. We have to continue with the okay. next speaker, uh, that is uh, Wendy González. Uh, she is uh, the leader of the Center of Bioinformatics and Molecular Simulations in the uh, University of Talca in Chile. She is an expert in structural bioinformatics, so we move from, from metagenomics uh, to, to uh, more structural bioinformatics and uh, protein computational analysis. So Wendy, please, when you are ready. Yes, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. So can you see the, the presentation, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So thanks, Javier. Uh, I will tell you a bit more about the molecular modeling of ion channel associated diseases. And when we talk about uh, ion channel associated diseases, we must focus in defects in ion function related with mutation of these channels and canalopathies, and also the dysregulation of their expression that cause uh, several diseases such as arrhythmias, cancer, etc. Um, how do we study these proteins uh, by means of atomistic models? So, uh, and, and using also molecular mechanic methods, uh, because we have um, very huge systems, right? We have proteins of about 7,000 atoms. And then when we embed this protein on membranes and with um, waters and ions around, we have a system of about 100,000 atoms. So, uh, Besides using molecular mechanics, we need a huge computational power uh, to study these proteins. And uh, between the computational approaches that we use, uh, they are the molecular dynamic simulations, they are molecular docking. And I will focus in this talk in the pharmacophore design uh, that we combine with virtual screening, but mainly I will focus uh, today in pharmacophore design that we um, implemented since 2015 in our group. And we studied um, several um, drugs with this approach. And the most recent is uh, this science paper where we describe the uh, negatively charged activators of um, three different uh, kind of potassium channels. And uh, we, we are really interested uh, to study uh, drugs targeting ion channels because uh, uh, we can explode this pharmacophore con concept and others that I will show you uh, in rational drug design. At the beginning, we uh, we studied the ion channels uh, and we were looking for specific drugs. Um, it was about uh, 2012, in fact. And uh, yeah, we sh at that time we, we saw that we did not have uh, many specific drugs for ion channels. But then uh, in the recent years, we also realized that um, the polypharmacological concept is, uh, I mean, is uh, very common between the drugs, right? And 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 even we have uh, anti-atrial uh, fibrillation drugs such as carbidilol or amiodarone uh, or dronedarone that are um, 
promiscuous drug. And in fact, this is really interesting. And, and, and that's the focus of our current research to try to understand how this promiscuous drug work. And um, this paper that I um, show it to you, uh, 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 the, the summary and, and uh, that we published in 2019, it's related to how uh, different activators of one kind of uh, channel, so let's say the K2P channels, the kind of potassium channels, also activates, for example, another kind of channel such as HERC and BK. And in the other way, also HERC and BK uh, activators can activate K2P channels. And why? Because they share a pharmacophore that is composed of negatively charged group and hydrophobic and aromatic group that you can uh, see here, right, in each of the drug, the negatively group, the hydrophobic and aromatic group, and they are separated uh, uh, with average distances and angles, right? And with this negative, uh, uh, negative, uh, uh, charge activator. Uh, what does this molecule uh, do with uh, in in a potassium channel? So they phase this charge to the um, ion pathway, and then we have potassium ions, and then so that there is a kind of uh, attraction, and and the potassium positive ions flow. Uh, more frequently, and these two parts, hydrophobic and aromatics, are inside the protein, are embedded into the protein. And so then what we have there are steric and electronic features that uh, ensure the optimal interactions with the uh, potassium channels. Uh, but we are going further and we are trying to understand and, and to report uh, what is called a receptor for models. So if we have a drug that binds, let's say, in three different uh, kind of, of, of channels, of ion channels, then we also may have a comparable pocket in these three channels. Uh, so it means that we have an, exam an ensemble of steric and electronic features necessary to ensure the interaction of this drug with these three channels. And to study this concept, what we are using is uh, the, the local anesthetic uh, binding site. And so if we see here, the local anesthetic has uh, in common an aromatic ring and intermediate linkage. And they differ here in, in this tertiary, I mean, composition. And uh, in this case, what, what we are studying are three um, local anesthetic lidocaine, bupivacaine, and ropivacaine. And we know from them the binding site in a um, sodium uh, ion channel in a potassium ion channel, channel that's one, and in KB1.5 uh, channel, that is a voltage-gated potassium channel. So we know by site-directed mutagenesis from the wet lab, the binding site of these drugs, and then we want to find this pattern. What we did was to get the channel structures, um, at the beginning, we had two homology models from KB1.5 and NAF1.5, and now we are redefining also our work because NAF1.5 crystal structure appeared in 2020. Uh, but I will show you the results that we have since now. And we have the crystal structure of TAS1. We did uh, some dockings in the binding side of these uh, channels. We identified the interaction profile in these binding sites, and then within this pocket, we try to compare them and uh, to uh, uh, to check some patterns. Right? We have here the Chilean flags because some of these tools were developed by um, our group or our alumni um, uh, around the world. And 
what we found, for example, with the Blip server, uh, was that uh, in the binding side of this drug, we have the identified uh, amino acids that have been identified by our group or, or by other using site-directed mutagenesis, uh, interacting with the drug. They are in green in each of the uh, binding sites, those that are ha has been identified as part of the binding site. And for example, this phenylalanine that is conserved in all the binding sites interacts by means of a pi pi or uh, perpendicular or parallel interaction with the aromatic rings of the local anesthetics. And uh, the binding sites are really hydrophobic, so you can see here the surface in green, uh, the hydrophobic surface, and they have a pattern. They have a pattern between uh, uh, that is shared in, in between TAST1, KB1.5, and NAP1.5 channel. And it's this geometrical pattern, but this uh, geometrical pattern, I prefer to focus in these three points of the geometrical patterns. Phenylalanine in all the channels, loisin here and isoloisin, because these three points are um, identified by site directed mutagenesis. And what we have found is that. Uh, this is uh, the output of the Young Finder um, um, program is that when we compare, compare pairs, let's say TAS1 with KB, NAF, and KB and TAS1 with NAF 1.5 channel, we assign a score that you can see here uh, of, of, of this pattern. And this score is divided 25% um, each of non-bonding interaction. So distance and perimeter parameters and the conservations of the amino acid. And what we have been observed that is different than uh, what we observe in the pharmacophore um, uh, features is that in the receptophore, so in the binding site of, of the proteins, what is more conserved in ion channels are the amino acids and the uh, non-bonding interactions, but the distance parameter and the perimeter, the geometrical parameters are not very conserved. And also we have been observed this in another ongoing project that we have uh, about the antiarrhythmic binding sites uh, in cardiac ion channels. And also we are doing a follow up to the, the science paper of the negatively charged activators in potassium channels. And also we have this, uh, uh, so uh, this, uh, we have been observed also this pattern um, of conservation in uh, these ongoing projects. I want to uh, finish thanking all my group, the funding agencies, and all for sure, thanks to you for being here today. Thanks a lot. Wendy, very nice talk. Uh, we don't have any any written question. I don't know if any of the attendees wants to write any any question at the moment. Um, well, very nice study, uh, Wendy, on the on the in the protein ligand, and specifically protein drug interaction. I see that the uh, potassium channels and these channels that you study are very much involved in many physiological um, parts. So uh, this homology that you, you find more at the structural level is later, let's say, um, translated in a physiological function of the, of the protein or, or not, not always. I mean, when you find homology in, at the structural level, and you kind of, uh, you find that the drug is active for this or that uh, channel. Do you find that this, let's say, uh, structural uh, homology is transferred uh, in a functional homology or physiological homology or not? I mean, what what the simil in the in the physiological uh, side is that you have a similar um, blocker patterns. So let's say that the 
So you have one drug that blocks the currents in these three channels. So and if you have one activator, you have one activator of three different channels. What differs is the potency. And, and I think that also the, it is related with the binding site so that mm, you may have some interactions that are, um, let's say, um, I, I, we need to define that, you know, but uh, they must be sometimes more potent in one channel than in the other. And then it could explain how the block is. Okay, so the, let's say the, the dynamics of the, of the binding is related to the, to the, to the strength of the drug as well when they are anesthetic, for example. Because yes. Because I see that lidocaina no, the, is, is not a strong anesthetic, but any other, some others are very strong. It, it depends. I mean, what I'm talking about uh, uh, related to this, how strong, uh, for example, a local anesthetic is, I'm talking about how strong is blocking a certain channel. So, okay. but in general, the, the local anesthetic does not bind, I mean, they are not very strong binding uh, ion channels. But uh, you may infer that some of them are stronger in one channel than in the other uh, due to this bind in their binding sites. That is different. It's, they have some common things, but it's different in each, sun, each channel. Mm -hmm. OK, Wendy, very nice work work there Thank in you. the structural part of, of structural and computational of proteins and ligands. So the, our last talk today is by Alejandra Medina from, from Mexico. Alejandra uh, works in the, uh, for the uh, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico in Querétaro and uh, She's more, let's say, in, uh, in the field of regulatory genomics, we could say. So it's a complementary view. These uh, four speakers today are presenting different aspects of uh, working in computational biology and bioinformatics in Latin America. This, this last talk by Alejandra is more on uh, regulatory genomics. I think they, they complement very well and they give a, a nice overview of uh, a lot of uh, different work that is doing in the in the region. So Alejandra, please, thank you for being here and you can start the presentation. Hey, Javier, thanks for uh, ECCB and Soybio for organizing this uh, nice encounter. Um, I think it's a very uh, good way to showcase research in Latin America. So today I'll talk to you about logical modeling of dendritic cells in vitro differentiation from human monocytes and how we unravel new transcription of regulatory interactions. So, okay, so I just want to highlight that this work is now available in BioArchive and was mainly led by my PhD student, Karen Julie uh, Nunez Reza, and it's a strong collaboration and partnership with uh, Dr. Denis Dieffrey at DNS Paris. Okay, so I'll talk to you about dendritic cells. So, what are dendritic cells? So, these cells belong to the immune system. They are antigen presenting cells. Uh, they activate T lymphocytes and they trigger the adaptive immune response. And that's why they are very uh, interesting and they have been uh, used for developing immunotherapies. So, uh, where do these dendritic cells come from? Well, mainly they come from the common dendritic cell progenitor, but they are usually low counts in our bloodstream because, well, they are usually appearing whenever we have an inflammatory reaction. And the other sort of dendritic cells are monocytes, which is pretty convenient because, I was, as I was telling you, uh, dendritic cells are very relevant for the development of immunotherapies. However, as I told you, dendritic cells are not usually widely available in our bloodstream unless we have uh, something going on. Hence, we don't really can use that for developing therapies, but we have a lot of monocytes in our bloodstreams that can be taken and then differentiate to uh, monocyte dendritic cells. So this is our aim of study. We want to understand how this monocyte dendritic cell differentiation happens, how is it regulated and controlled, and the main two um, things that we require for this differentiation to happen is to treat the monocytes with interleukin-4 and with CCF2. 
Uh, so we have these two elements, CSF2 and IL4, and these two will activate these four uh, signaling cascades, Merck, ERG, PA3K, PKB, NFK Pavita, and JAX Tadpo. So this will uh, make the cells proliferate, uh, go into survival as well, and differentiate. And we will have dendritic cells. And how this is happening? So some of the things that we also have to take into account is that we could have treated the cells only with one of these two elements, either CSF2 or interleukin, and they will result in different cell types. And we also need to have at least um, uh, some understanding of how this is, is, is decided. So we know that, uh, that if we only treat the monocyte with CSF2, we will have macrophages, and if we treat it with interleukin 4, we will have monocytes that have been activated. So our general aim, as I was telling you, is to understand how this differentiation happens, and we're going to do it through a dynamic model in order to complete this regulatory network. And how are these logical modeling built? So first of all, we take information from the literature. So we do a manual operation, uh, only took human data that had been treated with CSF2 and interleukin in the same timelines. Uh, we took only these kind of conditions and we really needed to have at least one article supporting any of the interactions, activations, repressions, anything. So after that, we did some simulations and we see whether our model predicts certain um, stable states and these stable states do uh, or do not seem to match the biological knowledge. And how we do this, we compare it with, for example, experimental data from RNA-seq, transcriptomics. So we have our uh, predicted stable state with certain, uh, uh, certain genes turned on or off and we compare this to the experimental setting and we see whether we match or not these expected on and off genes. After that, sorry about that um, we see if it agrees or not, and if it doesn't, we go and look into the epigenomic data in order to try to add new interactions, possibly, possibly regulatory. And then we go again uh, till we see that this, uh, our model matches the biology. So this was our first model that Karen developed uh, through reading a bunch of papers. And we put them in Gypsim, uh, which is a software that enables you to analyze these logical modelings. So here I show you briefly. So we have in, in green TSF2 and IL4, which are the inputs. And then they will trigger uh, certain cascades, signaling cascades as PA3K, MAPK, uh, and Kappa Vita. Jack stat. And well, this is basically our model. And one thing that I want to highlight is that we only have one output that, that is a cell marker for macrophages, MAFB. And we have a lot of transcription factors that are marked in uh, yellow that are actually sort of dead ends. So we have transcription factor that should be activating or repressing other genes, but you basically just stop there which means that maybe we're missing a lot of biology there. And we also have only two uh, monocyte dendritic cells marker that are really unique to these cells. So we decided uh, to go and look what was missing. And actually, yes, we knew that there were some uh, markers for dendritic cells that we were lacking and that we wanted to integrate. And we also require more markets for our other outputs, the macrophages and the monocytes uh, activated with interleukin-4. And here I only show you uh, the selected genes that we wanted to integrate into our model. So one of the questions now is like how we know that there is a bunch of genes were not already integrated because we couldn't find a connection in the literature that would clearly tell us what was turning them on or off. So we wanted now to know how to connect that into our network. So, sorry. Oh, yeah. so how do we, do we do this? So we need to go through three stages. We uh, do another literature search. Maybe we need something. Or, and then we can go and look for new transcription regulatory interactions. And then we can go and see finally our data is matching gene expression uh, that has been published for these cell lines. So, so literature search. Uh, so Karen went on again and read a lot of papers. And I'm only going to highlight uh, here two of the findings for time's sake. So for example, we have CD11, which is 8GAM, 
uh, that is known that is, it doesn't really differentiate well any of the cell types. So we decided not to include it because, well, it was not going to be as informative. But in the other side, we also found KL4, that is a very important regulator for monocyte differentiation that was not included. So we really needed to include this transcriptional regulator in our analysis. Uh, okay, so now we need to know how to integrate these genes, and for this we need to know if the transcription factors we are in, we had already integrated into a model, or that are important for the monocyte and the cell differentiation that were well known, um, can help us reconnect these genes. And how do we do this? So start, uh, one major thing is that uh, thanks to the Blueprint project, we actually have the epigenomes for the cell types and just a brief reminder of what an epigenome is. So we know that the DNA is wrapped around histones and the histones have marks, uh, post transcriptional modifications that are, now we have come to know a certain, uh, some of them are related to active enhancers or active promoters or active genes or voice uh, regulatory regions. So we use the blueprint data. We took uh, six histone marks and we ran from HMF, which is a tool that enables you to predict these chromatin states and the hence identify with you which are enhanced promoter transcription stars and or voice or repressed regions. So here uh, it's our annotation of the different states that we were able to predict. And here in the bottom, I show you the loci for IRF4. As I told you, there was an important gene marker for monocyte dendritic cells. And you can see that the track for epigenome states for the cell line is actually active things, active regulatory regions, while for microphages and monocytes, it's closed uh, polycom repressed regions. So we took from our chromatin state all the regions that were painted to be enhanced, transcription star sites, or active or voice, and we took those and we uh, analyzed them using the motif uh, from ENCODE, Hokomoko, Jasper, and Homer for our transcription factors of interest. And we scanned these regions uh, for all the genes that I showed you before that we wanted to add into the model using matrix scans from the ERSA tool. And here I show you our results. So we have the target gene that we wanted to add to the model. And here are the regulatory transcription factors. And in blue, I, uh, we marked uh, the regulatory interaction that we were able to discover. And in Asterix, we actually have some that have been proven. So these new interactions, we add them to the model. Uh, so here is now our new version with all these included. And again, in, in green, we see the input, CSF2 and IL4. And now we have many more um, out uh, nodes for monocyte and cells cells that are in light blue. We have some uh, out nodes for monocyte that are uh, markers like CD14 for cell, and we have for microphages, uh, many other genes, not only MAP2 now, that uh, like CD55. And we have now our transcription factors. You can see that they are not just nuisance, they are actually connected, and now they are regulating things, which was really important because that was missing. Uh, finally, so here I show you the stable state that we are able to recover when we run simulations using this model. So we have the two inputs here, CSF2 and IL4. And then we have the different Gs. This, just, this is larger. This is just a selection of uh, end nodes. So we can actually see something in the slide. Uh, but well, here I show you uh, uh, four different uh, stable states. Again, the first two lines are the inputs. So here you see where we have no inputs. We, well, we go to cell death, nothing really activates uh, the cell dies. And um, if we have only IL-4, we actually go to this monocyte activated within the 4 state that has cell CD14 and KL-4 activated. And if we only put CSF2, we expect microphages um, outputs to show. So we have exactly RFA, MAP-B that, that are very important for this cell type, and these two CD markers as well. And if we have the two inputs, as I told you, we expect now uh, the monocyte to go into the dendritic cells. So here we have CSF2 and L4, and we see that now we have markers for monocyte dendritic uh, cell like IHR, IL4, and STAT6, and CD209, uh, which are like the major ones. 
Okay, so now we want to compare these two gene expression data. And again, we took data from the Blueprint project. So they had gene expression for monocyte dendritic cells. So I show you here the three replicates for monocyte dendritic cells, macrophages, and monocytes. And here I show you uh, the genes that are, you can see that change that are for monocytes, like IL-4 and CD14, and then what you see when they are highly expressed, and actually we do see it uh, in monocytes. And here are, for example, uh, MAP-B, that is our gene for macrophages, and you see that it's uh, more expressed, um, it changes expression in macrophages. And we have for monocyte dendritic cells, uh, the stat, the two stat genes and IL-4, and you see again that they are on in monocyte dendritic cells and that the expression is changing. So this is concordant. So now we uh, decided that finally our model was complete. Obviously, uh, this uh, modeling, it's, um, you have to uh, go back and forth, but at some point you have to uh, finish the project or at least have something that is deliverable, which we think we have. Uh, so now we use this model to do some uh, trajectories analysis to see in the time uh, the commitment of our cell population using this model. So, yeah, in this case, I show you what happens with we treat the monocytes within the looking for. And what we see is that we start here with this um, orange line that is, means that most of the population of the cells will go into monocytes. And as long as the time we change for this uh, green population that has the CD14 and cell markers that are related to this monocyte activated within the looking for. And when we have monocyte treated with CSF2, they should go to micropages, and again we see this monocyte population in orange, that's how we start, and then we treat only with CSF2, and we see the increase of this population in blue, that is CD206 uh, and CCD151, uh, that is related to micropages, that are uh, cell markers, and if we treat with the two inputs interleukin 4 and CSF2, Again, we start with the monocyte population, and this decays. We have uh, spruits of uh, other cell types, but at the end, what we uh, conserve in the population is this purple uh, line that is related to monocyte dendritic cells markers. And if we do some knockouts, we can actually recapitulate what happens in the biology. So for the sake of time, I will only point out to a couple of them. So when we mutate the transcription factor, PU1, we see that uh, we lost the capability to differentiate to any of the cell type, which is something that is observed in the literature. Or when we mutate IR4, uh, we lost uh, some of the inputs for this monocyte interleukin 4 cell type. Microphages are not, act, uh, are not affected because the IR4 is only important for the differentiation for, uh, of monocyte dendritic cells. Sorry about the typos. Okay, so this is what we were able to find. And now I just want to thank uh, my lab, particularly Karen, uh, to take the risk to do her PhD with a young PI in Latin America. And uh, to all my collaborators, uh, Dr. Dini Tiefoli at Ivan CNS, Salvatore uh, Spicuglia at ECG and x Angelica Santana here at WAM, and Kaya Abreu at Langevio, and the founding agencies at uh, the National University of Mexico for the internal grant. Sorry about that. I actually put a uh, timer in case I was running out of time. And uh, Conacyt that gave us money to start this project. And if you want to contact me, well, please my Twitter. And at the beginning, I put Kana's Twitter also if you want to talk to her. Okay, thank you all. I'm happy to take any questions. Hope you have time. I think we do. Okay, thank you very much, Alejandra. Nice presentation. We have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one uh, by Clady. She is saying, Clady uh, Osorio, she is asking you if uh, you have a uh, uh, when you study uh, this uh, chromatin state and, and uh, the networks, well, the, the pathways, sorry, do you compare also with other kind of, of, of uh, immune cells, for example, CS for lymphocytes? Uh, or... 
Yes, so that's, a, that's a very good question. So in this case, as we were only interested in these street cell types that are related for particularly this model, we only focus on those, but uh, my collaborator, Angelica Santana, actually works uh, more in, in T cells. So there's also models for um, activation of T cells, uh, CD4, CD8, and TCR. Now we are working on that one. So uh, that's it. so we haven't really come into a model that could integrate those, uh, but we will be happy to, to at some point get there. So that's what one of the reasons we did now this model because we know the new cells. One of the reasons they're important for immunotherapies is that it's because they are trained to then activate these cells. And that's something that we were interested in. But we needed to first have this part of the model you know, to go to the next one. So yeah, uh, we, we, we haven't done it, but we will at some point. Yes, okay. So you are modeling, you say, uh, T cells in any different work, but mm -hmm. uh, because another question in that direction as well, as well by Teresa Rubio is, if you are uh, trying to consider the co-characterization of monocytes and T-cells? Yeah, that, that's our next aim. Um, well, we, uh, yeah, hopefully we can get there. There's always financial issues in Latin America, but uh, if, we, if we sort those out, then the next step will be actually to, to go a bit, and also into the disease states, like what happens for lupus people that are actually have this regulation of, of uh, the nucleic cell activation and T cell activation. So that's that's also something that we're interested in. Okay. Thank you. Those were the written questions, Alejandra. I understand that also you want to, this is my a little question by myself, you also want to to do a timeline no, of the how the the cells move from one cell type to another, no, it's not, uh, and how are you going to do that? In a, in a way of the, when you when you add these, um, uh, these factors, the cells evolve, but it's not a, let's say it's a, a, a through many intermediate states. So there is a timeline and also more differentiated, less differentiated, all these kinds of, at the end, you could have a mixed population of cells. So are you going to try to do that? Yeah, so actually the model predicts that, that we have like these sprouts of uh, two different cell types that are not really monosidentic cells, but that resemble them and they, they, they disappear and then everyone commits to the same state. But it's true that there is this intermediate state. And we're interested on that. We actually, uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to complain about money. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we wanted to do the different stages on RNA-seq uh, along the differentiation. So uh, we have already some um, gene markers and we think that can tell us exactly when these decisions are being taken. So maybe with some PCR, we can already pinpoint the time spots we want to analyze um, with transcriptomics, no? So that, that's uh, actually would be the best way to completely validate our model. Unfortunately, yeah, we got a bit stuck there. And, and then also, also, so we did have some money to do some of these experiments, but the problem is that the pandemic hit and we are still closed. So <laughs> I don't see that happening anytime soon, unfortunately, but that's, that's a great idea. Actually, that's, that, that would be the best way to prove the model is correct. Okay, we have just less than one minute to go for complete this session. Thank you very much to the four speakers, uh, Benilton, Gregorio, Wendy, and Alejandra. Very nice talks that I think they present a very nice glimpse of the bioinformatics in Latin America. Uh, very good groups uh, working in, in different areas of the computational biology with different approach, very complementary in many cases. I think, uh, thank you very much for all of you. Uh, also, we wanted to have, uh, in many cases of you, you are young, young researchers uh, uh, that also uh, shows the, the power and the future of the computational biology in the region. So thank you very much for the attendees. And if you want to join the Connect session is uh, in this afternoon, later on. Thank you very much.